Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ardra Cole, and I'm the Associate Vice President, Academic and Research here at the Mount. And uh, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to welcome you on this very cold winter evening. Uh, thank you for uh, leaving the warmth of your home space and, uh, and coming here to, uh, to, to share the space with us. Um, this is the launch of this year's interdisciplinary series, um, and this year's series is on the theme of childhood, and we're in t we've entitled it Not Just Kidding. This is our second interdisciplinary series, uh, following last year's really successful literacies as ways of knowing. And at the Mount, we really like to try to create spaces and opportunities for people to come together to think and learn about um, areas of common interest. And so um, we embarked on this uh, interdisciplinary series idea and uh, we're just delighted with, uh, with its success. And this year, we chose the topic of childhood because, um, you know, across our campus, we have so many faculty, and graduate student researchers, and undergraduate student researchers who um, are really interested in exploring childhood from a whole variety of perspectives. So, and given that it's um, a topic of such social significance, we decided that um, this year that would be the, the theme for our series. I'd like to um, thank the planning committee for, uh, for the series, um, Adriana Benzikin, Beverly Dietz, Susan Drain, Krista Montalpar, and Cornelia Schneider. Um, and I'd like to also thank the Children of the Child Study Center for their artwork, which I was told they um, very reluctantly let go of. <laughs> so um, I think that kind of adds a, a, a bit of reality uh, to, um, to the uh, discussions. Also like to thank uh, Andrew Godwin for his um, support and assistance with, uh, with promotion of the series. We have an exciting series planned with uh, monthly events uh, from now until June on a wide range of really interesting topics related to childhood. So I'll invite you to explore posters around um, and stay tuned for announcements. Uh, it's great to see you here and I hope to see you keep coming back again and again. Um, for more of the, um, the Childhood series. Without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Elizabeth Church to introduce tonight's special guest. Elizabeth. So, this is our presenter's water. I promise I have not drunk from this. It's be right there. So welcome everyone. It's, I'm really delighted uh, to uh, introduce Dr. Cavell. Dr. Catherine Cavell is a professor of psychology executive director and co-founder of the Children's Rights Centre at Cape Breton University. And throughout her career, Dr. Cavell has been a passionate advocate for children's rights. Although the UN approved the Convention on the Rights of the Child more than 20 years ago in 1989, many Canadians, including teachers and educators, are still unaware of the rights of children that are enshrined in that document. And Dr. Cavell has been working for many years to help Canadians and those beyond our borders become aware of this critical document through her writing, through her research, and her presentations. And at the same time, she has understood that we need to work directly with children and educate them about their rights. Along with colleagues, she developed children's rights curricula for children in grade six, grade eight, and grade 12 that was piloted in Cape Breton schools. And she and her colleague, Brian Howe, have also worked with the Hampshire Education Authority in England, who developed the very successful rights, respect, and responsibility initiative based on the Cape Breton model. Dr. Cavell is internationally recognized as an expert on children's rights. She repre represented the Canadian NGO community at the UN Special Session on Children held in New York in 2002 and reported on Canada's progress, which I don't think was very good, to the UN in, on the rights of the, uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child in Geneva in 2003. 
She was the lead re North American researcher on the UN Global Study on Violence Against Children, and she currently serves on the Board of Directors of the Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children and represents North America on, I have to, this is quite a uh, mouthful here, the UN NGO Advisory Council to the Secretary General on Violence Against Children. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Cavell. Introduction, it always makes me realize why I feel so tired all the time when somebody mentions all these things. So anyway, um, back in 1989, the Convention on the Rights of the Child was unanimously approved by the UN General Assembly, and it was very quickly signed and ratified by almost all countries of the world, including Canada, who ratified the Convention in 1991. The only states that haven't ratified it so far are three. There's the new country of South Sudan, which hasn't got around to it yet, uh, Somalia, which has been in a state of absolute chaos for as long as I can remember, and the US. Um, the US, there are many reasons why it hasn't ratified the convention, not the least of which is it has a sort of ideological abhorrence of um, anything to do with the UN. And the only time I've spoken there, I've been accused of being a nanny in a blue beret who should butt out and mind my own business. So, in principle, at least, um, much of the world has agreed that children should be seen as independent bearers of fundamental human rights. And by children, um, under the convention we're talking, all persons from birth to the age of 18. So in principle, there's agreement on this. In practice, things, I think, are, are very different. Um, it's very easy to see child rights violations in much of the world. Some of them are so obvious. We still have child soldiers. We still have child labor. We still have children working in the sex trade. And we still have many children who lack the basic necessities. But if we look closely, uh, Canada's not done very well living up to its commitments to improve the lives of children either. The most blatantly obvious, uh, the state of Aboriginal children. Aboriginal children are overrepresented in, in many areas of developmental difficulties and obstacles. They have inadequate health care, inadequate schooling. Their rates of poverty and their rates of suicide are twice the national average. And an astonishing 30%, almost one third of all children who are in the child protection system are children from Aboriginal communities. But it's not just Aboriginal children. Canada has not lived up to its convention obligations in many areas of children's lives. And obviously I'm not gonna give a comprehensive assessment of that here, but what I'd like to do is give you a promise of, a, a flavor of the promise of the convention and the reality and, and highlight the gap between the promise and the reality. I want to just point out, though, before I get into specifics, that the convention's not just um, a wish list. There are legal obligations that come with ratification, and those e legal obligations apply to both provincial and um, federal levels of government. So both are required to implement the convention in accord with their areas of uh, responsibility. The, the convention is to be um, implemented progressively over time. Nobody's expecting any state's party to go out and suddenly change all their laws and, and do everything perfectly. But countries should be showing that they are making an effort to implement the convention over time and to make sure that they are uh, they are to send reports to this special UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. Uh, that's uh, every five years. And that committee, in turn, assesses the progress, makes recommendations for change, and they actually issue back a report card um, which the country is supposed to respond to. It's supposed to let the population know where it's fallen short, what needs to be changed, and then it's supposed to actually implement some changes to improve the lives of children. The committee has repeatedly chastised Canada on uh, a number of issues, and repeatedly Canada's uh, done a very, very poor job in responding to the issues that have been raised by the committee. It's uh, not responded to the issues the committee has raised about Aboriginal children, about street children, 
and in fact about many of the issues in the three substantive areas of rights of the convention. So what are these rights? Well, the substantive rights of the convention are, are very often categorized into the three Ps. There are rights of provision, rights of protection, and rights of participation. Together, in, in essence, what the rights describe is, is a more or less global consensus on what the best conditions are for children's healthy development. So the protection rights focus on preventing physical and psychological harm, protecting the children from harmful substances, protecting children from all forms of violence, whether that's verbal violence, physical violence, or sexual violence, and also requires uh, that governments provide rehabilitation for children who have been exposed to violence or been exposed to abuse. The provision rights aim to provide the conditions for healthy physical, social, and cognitive development. So they include um, things like nutritious food, safe housing, medical care, child care, and education for all children. The participation rights, which are new in international law, say that children should be allowed to express an opinion in matters that affect them. That's not a choice. Some people get that confused. The convention has no provisions for self-determination, but a voice. Not a choice, but a voice. And children should have a voice in their families, in all legal proceedings affecting them, and in their schools. So I want to look at examples in um, each area of the three Ps, and we'll see how Canada's doing. Um, excuse me, starting with the protection rights. Are children protected from violence? Well, as was mentioned, I've been involved with uh, research for the UN study on violence against children and with efforts ever since to try to implement the study's recommendations. And whether we look at the, the global report, the North American report, or the, the report about what the children say, what comes out globally and commonly is that the most common source of violence in children's lives is in their family. One of the really interesting things about the, the UN global study on violence against children was it included children. It's, to my knowledge, the only UN document that's actually included children. And the Seen, Heard, and Believed report um, that you can see up on the screen there was based with uh, focus groups with children across Canada. And I want to just give you um, an example of some of the children's comments on violence in the family. And these are from children in Nova Scotia. I think you can... You can see from these comments that children are acutely aware of family violence. They're also acutely aware of its effects. So that these are local children telling us their experiences, as are these. I thought that was a particularly compelling statement. And the children are absolutely right. The more they witness violence, the more they themselves become violent. And one of the key problems and one of the things that children were referring to was um, that under Section 43 of Canada's Criminal Code, there was a legal defense for hitting children. And this is one area where the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has chastised Canada repeatedly. We actually have really strong legislation that prevents us from hitting each other as adults. It also prevents us from hitting our pets. I mean, if you are convicted of hitting your dog or your cat or your bird, you're going to lose it. But we continue to allow for adults to hit children. And it's pretty embarrassing, I think, when we look globally. Uh, Canada is notably absent from the list of countries with a complete ban on corporal punishment. A uh, couple of noteworthy things there. One is South Sudan. Um, one of the first moves the new government made when South Sudan became its own country was to have a complete ban on hitting children. So that's a complete ban in all settings. 
Uh, another noteworthy thing there is the number of states that have um, brought in a ban, a full ban on corporal punishment till, since 2006, which was when we released the global study on violence against children, and this was one of the recommendations in the study. Um, Sweden is so far ahead of us. <laughs> It's quite astonishing. But you can see all those countries there, and where are we? We're not there. Part of the problem is that people still seem to think it's OK to spank children as a form of discipline. There's a lot of problems with that, which I don't have time to go into. But one thing we should be aware of is that spanking often gets out of hand, and it escalates into abuse. These data of oh, sorry, these data are from the uh, Canadian Incident Study of uh, Abuse and Neglect. This is the most recent data, and consistently, what's been found in that is that around 75% of substantiated cases of abuse occurred during what we might think of as ordinary, everyday physical punishment. But it's not. It gets out of hand because it's not effective in changing children's behaviour. And not only does corporal punishment sometimes escalate to the point of physical abuse, it also sometimes escalates to the point of child maltreatment deaths. Again, um, if we look internationally, if we compare our rate of documented child maltreatment deaths, Canada doesn't look very good. You know, this is one of those times when one is happy that there are countries like Mexico and the US, because then we don't look quite so bad as we might otherwise. Raising um, children in, in households where they're subjected to abuse and neglect, um, where they're subjected to violence, can set children on a developmental pathway that uh, is not a very positive one. Um, sometimes it leads them into the child protection system. Sometimes it leads them into the juvenile justice system. And either way, things are not good. Uh, again, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview because of uh, this is a, a one-shot talk. So um, let's start by looking at what happens when children go into the child protection system, when they must be removed from their families of origin. At any one time in Canada, the estimates are that there's somewhere between 80,000 and 85,000 children um, who have a history of abuse and neglect in their family who are in the so-called child protection system or the children's aid system, a system that is fraught with problems in every province and every territory. The key problems, one is that removal from the family is very slow. It often means the child has suffered considerable developmental difficulties before being removed. It certainly uh, leads to the likelihood of the child um, evidencing emotional problems, behavioral problems. The convention says that when children have been exposed to abuse and neglect, they should be provided a stable environment in which to recover. We don't do that in Canada. We move children multiple times among different foster families. We tend to move them in and out of foster families, back home to a different foster family, back home to a different foster family, and so forth. The average number of placements for a child is seven. Some youth have reported up to 11 different placements in one year, and that will often be with 11 different schools and so forth. Um, the maximum number of placements I've seen with a, a child have been 31. The far cry from stability that the convention says they should have. And that's the ones who are lucky enough to have foster homes. We have a tremendous shortage of foster homes across our country and what happens is a lot of children end up being placed in group homes or even hotels. You can bet it's not the Hilton. As many people have noted, including these children at Province House, children who are abused in their families are sometimes further abused by the system rather than protected by it. The other thing, as I mentioned, that happens sometimes when children are raised in violent households or when they're abused or neglected in their early years is that they somehow end up in the juvenile justice system 
And like children in the care system, children in the justice system are often further abused. The abuse tends to start at the time of arrest. There's some headlines um, over one issue, and that's been the use of tasers by police forces. There's some headlines from across the country over the last few years. Um, the tasers were used on a, a teen who was drunk and passed out in the back of a car, hardly a threat. Tasers were used on high school kids to break up a brawl. And the boy who was killed by tasers was 17 years old and he was being arrested for breaking into a car. The youngest child we know of to date that's been tasered was an 11 year old who was living in foster care. So we know this is a child who has a history of abuse and neglect. Uh, he was tasered by RCMP officers as he emerged from a home where it was suspected he might have stabbed somebody. Uh, once kids are in detention, uh, things typically get worse. There we go. Um, we are now in the second inquest into the death of Ashley Smith. I'm sure everyone in this room has heard of Ashley by now. Ashley was 15 when she was initially given a 90-day jail sentence in New Brunswick. Um, what she had done that earned her that 90 days in jail was throw crab apples at a postal worker. But she remained behind bars as she racked up multiple charges and additional sentences while she was incarcerated. Over an 11 month period, she was transferred 17 times to different facilities where she spent the majority of her time physically restrained in isolation cells. To control her behavior, she was not only restrained, uh, she was sometimes tied down with duct tape, she was injected with antipsychotic drugs, and reports say that she was unable to contain her feelings of fury at being tasered, gassed, shackled, drugged, and isolated. I would think fury is a very reasonable response to that kind of treatment. It's treatment that is really antithetical to the convention. At age 19, in 2007, Ashley strangled herself with a ligature around her neck while prison guards watched. And if you're listening to the news right now, um, the argument is that she was just trying to get attention. Well, so what if she was? She needed it. Um, but she was playing a game with the guards. They said, so I wanted to show you this poem that Ashley wrote before her death. I think that poem suggests she was planning to end her suffering. I don't think she's playing games there. The kind of abusive treatment that led Ashley to kill herself is not rare in Canadian youth detention facilities. We, uh, for part of the UN study on violence against children, we asked children who'd been in the system to describe their experiences, and here are some comments. Uh, I just pulled out three, but the same kind of things were said again and again by kids who were in the system uh, across the country. In essence, um, there's very little evidence that Canada's living up to its commitment in terms of protecting children from violence or um, any other of the child protection rights in general. So um, I was going to turn now to the second category of rights I mentioned, the rights of provision. And let's see how Canada does in terms of provision rights. Well, take a look at the uh, international graph on child poverty. and. The sad news is Canada, which is not exactly a poor country, stands 25th, 24th of 35 OECD nations. And on the graph there, which I think was 2009, I think the um, poverty rate is 13.3% yeah, 13 in Canada. It actually, the next year of 2010, which is the, the last year for which I could find valid statistics, um, the 2010 child poverty rate in Canada was 14.5% overall. 
Uh, the lowest was in Alberta at 11%, the highest in PEI at 22.5, and Nova Scotia was above the national average at 16%. It's a problem for children when poverty is early and when it's chronic. And it, it really does put the child at risk for a number of negative outcomes. Um, children raised in poverty have less nutritious diets. They have greater rates of obesity and they have greater rates of injury and illness. Children who are raised in chronic poverty don't do as well at school. They're less well prepared for school. They're more likely to have some kind of learning difficulty, more likely to perform poorly, fail, repeat grades, and without appropriate interventions, they're more likely to drop out early and so you feed into the intergenerational transmission of poverty. Also interfering with their educational success is a higher prevalence of behavior disorders and behavior problems. It's really hard to sit still and focus in school if you're tired or hungry or anxious about what's going on at home. I also wanted to mention, um, there's a very recent report from the Canadian Pediatric uh, Society about uh, dental care for children. Um, in many provinces, children from low-income families, as you can see there, they receive free dental care until they're age 18. And in the territories, uh, there's widespread dental coverage for most children. That's consistent with the convention. In Nova Scotia, provincial coverage ends at age 10. And what they found was that that means that a lot of children just end up in emergency room uh, with facial infections and with abscesses that have been caused by inattention to preventive dental care or to cavities that the parents haven't had the money to get fixed. I want to stress that these, these poor outcomes um, that children are at risk of when they're, they're raised in families living in poverty have nothing to do with um, low-income parents being bad parents. It's not the case at all. What they are associated with are the incredible levels of stress that parents experience when they're trying to raise a child without sufficient supports or sufficient resources. Under the convention, governments are supposed to help families as much as they can to help with the rearing of their children. So you have better um, situation for the rearing of children, but neither provincial nor federal levels of governments are really pulling their weight. So we have you know, 16, 20% of, of families struggling and living in stressful conditions. Lots could be done to reduce the poor outcomes associated with poverty. I mean, the obvious are to um, expand health and dental uh, care, that would make a big difference. But I think two other areas that would make a huge difference, which would be consistent with the convention obligations, would be, um, first of all, to provide uh, school meal programs, have a national school meal program, and also to have affordable and accessible child care. A lot of countries um, do have free school lunches for children and or breakfasts. Um, Finland, Sweden, India, which is not a rich country, has free school lunches. And even the US provides free school lunches for low-income children. Other countries um, have a pay-as-you-can uh, meal program, uh, and they're usually set up in ways that children are not stigmatized. I wanted to give you a, a sample from France. France, um, children pay what they can, or if they can't, they get school lunch free. But I think this is the most amazing model of uh, school lunch. Here's a typical menu. And this is, this is for real. I mean, I, I found many menus. The only reason I picked this one, not because it looked particularly appealing, but because it was a very clear one on the web and it was in English. Um, but they actually do provide children a five-course lunch every day, and they ensure that that is nutritious. And they use this as a means of teaching children about healthy eating. And not surprisingly, uh, we find that France has the lowest rate of child obesity in the world. 
And my guess is they have the happiest school kids if they get stuff like this every day, I don't know. Canada has no national school bills, uh, no programs. We, we have sporadic ones. We have um, you know, different organizations. In Cape Breton, we have a number of areas where people are working hard to provide breakfast for kids. But the convention would obligate a national meal program so that every child can get nutritious food. We know if children have nutritious food at school, they're healthier, they miss less school, they're better able to focus, their achievement is much better, and so forth. We're not doing very well on protection. We're not doing very well on provision of uh, basic resources. We don't have the national meal programs. How do we do with childcare? How do we measure up with the provision of accessible and affordable childcare? I think the best data here comes from UNICEF. UNICEF um, compared childcare in developed nations on 10 benchmarks. So first of all, let's see how Canada did compared with other countries. That's how Canada did. Of 25 countries, we, we rank last in a tie with Ireland. Sweden, uh, remember Sweden? 1979, no more corporal punishment. Sweden at the top of the list met all 10 benchmarks. Anybody want to hazard a guess on how many benchmarks Canada met? Out of 10, how many would you guess? None? Oh, you're a real pessimist. <laughs> we actually made one, so you're very close. One out of 10. And you know what it was? And if can you read that, or is it too small? Yeah, the only one the only one we um, we got was that half of our what is it? Half of the half of the staff are accredited. Whoopee! Half of the childcare staff are accredited. And you notice there's some basic health measures on there as well. That, that is shameful, I think. Um, high quality childcare is so important for children who are growing in disadvantaged circumstances in poverty. It can significantly improve their social, emotional, and cognitive growth, their readiness for school, and it can increase the likelihood that they're going to do well in school. And, and we all know that educational achievement forms the basis for future health and future opportunity. So we're not doing very well on provision rights. We're not doing very well on protection rights. Let's turn to participation rights. And I thought for participation rights, we just talk about schools. Remember, um, participation rights mean that children should have a voice. They should have some opportunity for expressing their opinions and having, you know, having the opportunity to participate in matters that affect them. So what happens? Um, most of Canada schools are very authoritarian. So we start out with our kids really wanting to learn really wanting to go to school, right? They're all very excited. They can't wait to learn how to read. They can't wait to go to school. They're so happy. And shortly after they've started, things kind of change. They rather quickly become bored and disengaged. It doesn't have to be that way. Okay. As was mentioned in the introduction with my colleague, Brian Hauer, I've had the privilege of monitoring the implementation and the effects of rights consistent schooling over a 10-year period in England. These schools have been restructured so that they're consistent with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and part of that consistency includes the right to participate. There are widespread opportunities for meaningful participation in all aspects of school functioning. And the participation is particularly uh, useful and meaningful for their children because they're explicitly taught about their rights. Okay, so they have that framework for assessing situations, for critical thinking, for the formation of opinion and so forth. Let's give you a few examples. Um, the kids participate in all 
uh, policy procedures across the school, but also at the beginning of each year, they, they set up a charter for their classrooms. These kids would be seven years old. So the charter is developed in collaboration with the teacher. The children and the teacher decide, um, based on their rights, uh, what kind of rights and responsibilities will they agree to that they will use to make sure everybody has a good year. So they develop this charter. The um, plates on this one, or their faces, which were plates, plate faces, <laughs> are um, their, their signatures, basically, that they have all agreed that this is how they're going to, to run the, the classroom. They do this right away in September, and then they refer to it, both the children and the teachers refer to it through the year, if there are any issues, if somebody forgets what they're supposed to be doing. Um, one of the things we saw in one of the classrooms we, we were at was um, a little boy was getting rather frisky and uh, interfering somewhat uh, with another child, and, and she turned to him and she said, excuse me, you're interfering with my right to an education. I think you need a time out. And he said, oh, OK. And he went and sat in the chair in the corner. I've <laughs> never seen anything like that before. But it's, it's because the kids are involved in, in um, designing what the classroom rules are, if you like, the rights for the classroom. Are they, they adhere to them. They like it. They're comfortable with it. They participate um, across the school in their learning activities. A lot of the um, learning is done cooperatively, so you have cooperative uh, small group learning, a lot of project-based learning, again, um, usually in small groups. They, they have um, a say in how they learn things. So just uh, give you a brief example. Um, there was one class we saw, and on the learning outcomes for that particular year was learning about war World War II. You know, that can be taught didactically. And the children through rote learning can memorize dates and battles and so on and so forth. But what this class uh, was allowed to do because of the participation rights, they were allowed to determine how they would like to learn about World War II. And they decided what they would do was set up a museum. So um, having decided on that and agreed on that as a class, they then uh, broke into groups based on interests. So some of the, the children researched, designed, drew up, got hold of clothing um, that was appropriate to the era. Um, some um, did model guns and tanks and built little battle scenes and so forth. Um, others uh, role-played children who'd been separated from their families and wrote very poignant letters and so on. So they, they did all this, they filmed it, they set up their museum and they invited somebody in from a local museum to assess what they'd done. That was how they learned about the war. I mean, the excitement was palpable, they were so into it. So that kind of involvement in learning and always the right perspective. Um, I just love this example. If I can get the right one up. Um, this was a, a small child, um, they had just finished learning the story of Cinderella and they were discussing it and instead of the normal, they were mean, uh, you know, you can see the very specific issues here. Right? infringed her right to protection from abuse and it infringed her right to play because Cinderella had a right to play. So it gives you an example of, of how the children are taking what they learn and they're generalizing it and they're using it as a basis for critical thinking. The children are also represented on all school committees. Um, they were represented on expenditures, on budget committees. Um, they very often were asked, you know, if there was some leftover money, what would you like? And uh, they, they would check with their peers. And if it was something that was doable, they got it. One school we were at, the children had asked for a fish tank, and the fish tank was proudly displayed in the hallway. Another school that asked for something, some wonderful play structure that was impossible, and it was denied, but it was explained to them why. But my favorite was um, the fact that children were also represented on hiring committees. And in one of the infant schools there, um, the infants, by the way, uh, infant schools in England, the children are four to seven years old. So at one of the infant schools, they were hiring a new what they call dinner lady. 
dinner ladies, which seems like a horribly politically incorrect term, um, were local people who would come in and help serve hot lunches to the children. And they needed a new dinner lady. So the children were represented on all committees, so this little five-year-old was on the uh, hiring committee and she was told she could have three questions to ask the candidates. And she asked the following three questions. She said, do you like children? Are you a good cook? And do you shout? And I couldn't think of any better questions to ask a prospective dinner lady. So they take it very seriously. So the kids are involved across the school. They have a voice in everything. They know about their rights. Their rights are being respected. What is it doing for the teachers? Um, the teachers initially were kind of scared about the amount of authority they'd be losing with the children having more participation. Um, but here are some sample responses from the teachers. Uh, things were not horrible. <laughs> the school climate was improving. The respect for everybody was in including, um, and the children were behaving in a much more pro-social manner. In fact, bullying uh, is almost unheard of in those schools now um, because of the, the use of rights to settle the, the disputes and because the children are so engaged in school because of their meaningful participation. We actually, um, we have 10 years of scientific, if you will, data on, um, the effect of rights-based schools on children and their teachers. But I think the most compelling, um, the best example of the changes this had on children was a statement from a child in uh, this particular school. Uh, we, we had done some interviews and we were doing some focus groups with the children and one of the questions we asked was, if you could change one thing about your school, what would you change? So. My favorite example is coming up, um, but there was something very strange about this school. It was a, a rural school. It was fairly small. There were maybe 10 staff. It, at this point, it had been two years since they had restructured the school to be rights-based. And during that two years, there had been 13, yes, 13 pregnancies among staff. So when we asked the question, what would you change? What is the one thing you would change about your school? Here's our favorite answer. Gosh darn eternity leaves. <laughs> so, hard to get better than that. I think where Canada is seriously committed to the implementation of children's rights, we'd see more children who are this happy at school. Uh, we'd see more children who are protected from violence. We'd see more children with their basic needs met. And we'd see more children allowed to participate in a meaningful way in their everyday lives. That's the promise of children's rights. My hope is that the promise or the gap between the promise and the reality can gradually get closed as more and more people learn about the Convention on the Rights of the Child and how the full implementation of its protection, provision, and participation rights really can improve the life of every child. Because ultimately, if we have knowledge, we can change the world. Thank you. Things that are leading further, further about the uh, declaration of, uh, of the, on the rights of children or, um, you know, things that are related to that. So we would like to open up the floor to you and um, you can ask her questions about your own concerns or things that came up during the talk. Anybody wants to start? <laughs> I'm Gusta. I was curious. You had mentioned that um, you did a pilot. Pro you did a pilot project with the curriculum in Cape Breton, and I'm just wondering how that went. And when you tried it in Cape Breton, what the results okay. were? Um, we started with uh, a group of grade six classes in Cape Breton. Um, it went extremely well. Um, 
trying to do a short answer here. The um, Department of Education for Nova Scotia was was very pleased with the, they independently assessed. Um, within Nova Scotia, what happened was they asked us to then produce further curricula, which we did, the grade eight and the grade 12. Um, and ultimately, the Department of Education took those um, activities uh, that, that were part of the, the resources that were produced and they incorporated them into K through six health and social studies curricula, but um, in a very watered down way without really restructuring the way teaching was happening or anything was happening in the school. But it, it is officially a learning outcome in Nova Scotia for children at some point to learn about the convention. Um, the other thing that happened with them was that we, we published the findings in an academic journal which was picked up by the Times Educational Supplement in England and that's what led to the adoption of the approach in England. So it, it grew in the UK and it sadly shrunk in Nova Scotia. Um, my name is Fernando Nunes. I'm a faculty member in Child and Youth Study here at the Mount. And uh, in one of my courses I deal with um, the UN Convention on the Rights of, of Children. And actually this question comes from my students and I tried to answer it and I hope I answered it in the right way and that's why I'm asking you. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, they asked me when um, a country, uh, when we see comparative analysis such as, such as poverty, um, that includes countries like, for example, Mexico or India with Canada, um, are the poverty level, the, the, um, the limits that, that determine uh, what the poverty line are are not going to be the same for both sets of countries. Yeah. So how, do we, how can we compare ourselves to them? Um, what is it UNICEF does? They, they look at 50%, 50 just call on my partner here. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they, I think they they do it within the country by looking at the fifth, the median. I think income in the country, and then who's below and who's above, right? More yeah. or less. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's not it's not an absolute figure. It's relative to that country. Yeah. Is that what you tell your kids? Good. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we learned this from you as individuals, what are some things we can do to help you know, sp spread the word, so to speak, or do something about these issues? Let me throw it back at you. What do you think you can do? Well, my parents are, I help my parents, they have five foster children, so that is something I can tell them about. Um, but part of me feels um, slightly helpless because that's as far as I know I can take it. I, I don't know how. I think that um, if everybody leaves this room and takes the knowledge with them that, there, that Canada has legal obligations to improve the lives of children and passes that on to one person. You've seen the movie uh, Pay It Forward. You know, if, if each person here told three people and if you all go out and help one child or advocate for one area, like there's some um, really good work going on right now in Nova Scotia. There's a lot of us are advocating for changes to the child protection system. Um, you could write a letter to your MLA, you can write a letter to your um, local newspaper, you can tell your friends, you know, kids should not be treated the way they're being treated in the, the child protection system and it's wonderful to hear your mum's fostering and you're there. Just being um, a mentor for children yourself, you know, you, you could be that special person that puts a different balance on between risk and resilience for a child and you respecting that child rights. You know, if each person in this room went out and respected the rights of one child, it would make such a difference. So don't feel you've got to change the world. 
I just like playing with my right Superman. I don't really expect anyone to change the world, one kid at a time. And I really appreciate what you said. Thank you. Thank you. Just to follow up from that last question, um, if Canada is not following legal obligations, is there not an opportunity for some organization to take the government to court? There, there is no a sort of international court or international police with international conventions. Um, mostly what you do is you try to shame the government into fulfilling its international obligations because no country really wants to be... Yeah, I, back up a little bit. I think one of the reasons Canada doesn't tell people about the convention and what their obligations are is because it doesn't want to be shamed internationally. It's embarrassing. You know, um, so I, I think what, what we can do is make it known to our politicians that we are aware that they're not living up to their obligations. And there are, um, just the other part of your question, the Canadian Coalition on the Rights of Children does do a shadow report to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. Um, when I um, gave the report some years ago, you know, our job was to, to bring to the attention of the committee from our perspective where the locks were because what the government does, it goes to the Committee on the Rights of the Child with pages and pages and pages of statistics and it says we put this money in here, we put that money there. And when I was there, the head of the committee said, I don't care how much money you put in things, show us what difference it made. Don't tell me how much money you gave Aboriginal reserves. Why are the children still in this state? You know, so, so you can have, um, you can work through coalitions, you can work nationally, you can work provincially to make sure that those reports get to the UN committee and then the UN committee can shame Canada. Canada is actually supposed to publicize the reports it gets back from the Committee on the Rights of the Child. So I think one thing that would be interesting to do would be to write to the government and say, please may I have a copy of the report? You'd probably hide it. I'm just wondering your thoughts about the difference between the uptake of the curriculum that you developed uh, with the Nova Scotia Department of Ed and um, the British system, if, if you could kind of develop your model about why it went such uh, disparate ways. I, I think um, part of it is leadership. Um, in what, what happened um, was the, the results were quite compelling from Nova Scotia. Um, and it just, you know, serendipity. <laughs> the head of this particular school district in England read that. And he told us he'd been, he'd been looking for um, a way of having some kind of a, a moral, if you like, framework for the schools to function within. In, the, in his area of the UK, because he was concerned about the fact that, you know, the religious schools were operating within a sort of an ethos of Christianity, but there was no real ethos for the other schools. And he read this and he thought, this is it, the, the children's rights. Um, so it was taken very seriously right at the beginning. And um, there, there's a system in England whereby uh, the, the particular school district or area can get, obtain some money from the government to study new things. So they initially got some, gov some governmental money and brought some groups of people over to CBU and they worked with Brian and I um, and they went to the schools in Cape Breton who were doing it. And then based on what they saw, they took it back and they got money from the British government to do a five-year implementation. So they did that um, in, in a very systematic way involving people. And, and the fact that the people who were initially involved were getting free tips to Cape Breton went over very well. So a lot of people were saying, I want to I want to do this, I want to do this. But it, it, it was done so systematically and very slowly and, and we monitored it, right? Um, we got money from uh, social sciences to uh, to research what was happening as they did this, so so it's it's well designed. It's designed uh, comprehensively, systematically for implementation over time. Lots of supports, 
and they're getting constant feedback from, from researchers on, on what's happening, which they found particularly reinforcing. Um, that's the difference in terms of how it happened. The difference in terms of the way it was is what we had in Cape Breton were individual classrooms. What they have there are, are whole school approaches. So the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child becomes the operating framework for the school. All the school policies and procedures and everything is convention based and rights becomes the common language, the common discourse for all staff. Uh, teaching and non-teaching staff and children. So it, it's a holistic approach which has been put into place very slowly and systematically. Does that answer your question? If not, I can send you lots of material to read, Jamie. <laughs> so how did the parents react? I suspect you said some, uh, that some of the parents may have well, been a bit disconcerted by this approach. Uh, interesting question. Um, we have two extremes. I'll start with the worst. Um, actually, this is the only time I think we've ever had a parent complain, and it was really quite distressing. And this was in British Columbia. We were working with a school in, in the lower mainland of BC, and things were going very well. And we were asked to meet with the parents, which we did. And this one parent said, um, how dare you teach my child? She has rights. I'm a single mother. My child is coming home demanding nutritious food. And I said to her, Missy, I'll give you nutritious food. And she said, you can't hit me anymore, mum. I have a right to be protected from abuse. You can't hit me anymore. She said, How dare you teach my child she has to have nutritious food and I can't hit her. It's a tough one to answer. The other extreme um, is from the UK. Um, now let me give you one from Cape Breton. Um, one of the teachers who, who his classroom was doing the rights, um, he, he was laughing, he phoned us and he said he had a, a parent call him and he said, I don't know what the heck you're doing with my kid, but whatever you've started doing, don't stop. He's never been so cooperative. Um, and we talked to the kid about that and it turned out that um, he had decided the reason his parents were sending him to bed was because it was his right to grow up to be strong and healthy and so it was okay to get some sleep, so he'd stop fighting better. <laughs> um, my favorite one comes from England, uh, where um, actually the same school that everybody was pregnant, except the guys. Um, the, the principal was telling us that um, he got a call from a parent saying, you sent home this information telling us that you respected my child's rights and that you, that meant you would listen to my child. And my son came home yesterday and he was really upset because um, he got into trouble for something he didn't do and nobody listened to his side of the story. And the principal said that, you know, he, he was absolutely right and he apologized and he called the child in and he apologized to the child. And in fact, the child hadn't done anything wrong. Um, so everything was smoothed over, but the parent had actually intervened to support the rights of the child. We've had no complaints at all. I mean, uh, it's, you know, it's not a panacea. It's not like you're gonna go out there and tell kids they've got rights and all of a sudden they're all gonna be wonderful and all the behavior disorders are gonna go. And that, that's not reality. But it, it has um, significantly, over the time we've measured it, significantly improved their pro-social behavior, decreased their antisocial behavior. Um, it's improve their academic achievement, their engagement and their respect for others and their promotion of the, for the rights of other children. And the, the results have been so powerful that in one area of Hampshire County where we were working, the police chief recommended rights education as a means for reducing vandalism because he had seen such a difference in the kids. And I've forgotten what you asked me. Did I answer it? <laughs> Parents, that was it, not police chiefs. <laughs> I'm just wondering, it seems like you've developed a wonderful program for school-aged children. Have you considered developing curriculum for early childhood education, so three to five-year-olds? We have a coloring book. Did I send you a color? Is it over there? Okay, the coloring book. 
which is on our website. You can you can download and get it printed off. Um, and there's a there's a teacher guide on, on using it. And um, there was um, a school in British Columbia I read about. Um, they had they had done a research article. I didn't know anything about it until I tripped over the article. But they had used the coloring book with their kindergarten class. And what I remember from that was the phrase that after the children had used the coloring book and learned about their rights, it changed the um, ethos of the classroom from me to we. So please use it. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. I just wanted to find out if you had had any um, interest from any African countries in using a participatory rights-based um, schooling or education engagement? Yeah, we've, um, we've had um, quite a bit of international interest in the curricula. Um, I can't recall offhand, I stopped keeping track. But because everything's online, and um, but we have given permission to a number of places to translate it. Um, I think um, South Africa has done some work in with with school children. I can't remember. Wouldn't it be nice if Mali was doing that? Yeah, I, can't, I can't remember. But yeah, yeah. Um, having done having done a lot of research with children uh, myself, uh, interviewing children and so forth, so the what you said about giving children voice mm. um, has a lot of meaning to me, mm. and I have seen the effect of you know doing interviews with children and actually asking them themselves about yeah. their experiences and what they think about certain things. Um, the issue I have encountered with that, and that this question might go a little bit towards, um, you know, research ethics and research methods, is that parents are not necessarily happy all the time to have their children interviewed. And, but ethically, you need, you need this, you need the signature of the parent mm. to give the mm -hmm. consent for the children. The children can only give the assent yeah. in terms of, um, you know, participating on a mm. research project. So, um, and I have had cases where the child wanted to participate, but the parents said no. Mm -hmm. So what, have you encountered those, those moments and how, how would, I mean, it's, it's, there's no final answer to this, of course, you know, but how would you negotiate those kinds of yeah, situations? Yeah, it, it is really difficult. I mean, it, it's particularly difficult if you're dealing with sensitive issues. You, if you want to ask children their thoughts about corporate punishment, for example, and you have to ask the parent, chances are, the ones who are using it are not going to allow you to talk to the children. Um, we we haven't had that directly as a problem because, um, thank God, in England we haven't needed to go to the parents. The um, administrators and principals um, have been okay um, to, like their own ethics committee have okayed everything without going through the parents. The other thing I think of, with the... Um, the, the UN, the kid report that I mentioned, the seen, heard, and believed, um, we did focus groups with children which are less threatening to parents because your, your child's, you know, the children are talking in groups. But the other thing we did was we, um, we worked with an, another group of children, actually a local group in Cape Breton, to do a content analysis on what the other children had told us. So that was a way of, of bringing out what was most salient to all the children without there being any individual that could possibly be identified. But I mean, the issues I, I have in other research, I've, I, um, I've also had issues where I've come across a child who was being sexually abused and you are legally required, required to report it. So it, it's, it can be terribly difficult. You have to be really careful. I sympathize with what you're trying to do. <laughs> Okay, well, um, okay. thank you so much. Maybe another round of applause for Dr. Covell. <laughs>